My dear parishioners, I would like in this third and final conference of our Lenten retreat today to speak about some pastoral matters and concerns and aspirations, what I would like our parish to become, to strive for. And I will begin by mentioning, you might have noticed on the schedule for the day that I put on the door, as you come in the church, it says annual Lenten retreat. We have had a retreat like this before, but it hasn't been consistent every year. So by putting that there, I'm announcing my intention to make sure this is an annual event on a Saturday around the beginning of March, probably, during the season of Lent. I would like to especially begin these reflections that I will share with you by reflecting upon the importance of gratitude. I believe that God has blessed us very much. There are many wonderful groups of traditional Catholics around our country and in other countries, but we have been blessed with not only a parish, a good number of parishioners, religious, a school, two priests, so that you have mass, at least one public mass every day. And even though I travel, there's always a priest here. And so we have many blessings to give thanks to God for. But we also have to guard against complacency, against taking for granted what we have and maybe not appreciating it fully or not making the greatest use of the blessings that God has given to us. And as the reading at lunch pointed out, the important thing is to be Christian, not just in name, but in our lives. And this was the problem before Vatican II, wasn't it? That so many Catholics were Catholic in name only, or they were what are often called Sunday Catholics. They didn't eat meat on Friday, and they went to Mass every Sunday and put their donation in the collection basket and maybe went to uh, stations in Lent or, or something extra, but not much more. We have to make certain that our Catholic faith permeates our life, our way of life, all of our activities. And this is especially important because of the age in which we live, a time in the history of the world when society has deviated farther and farther from the path of God's commandments. You can go back, let's say, to the 1940s, 1950s, and before, and even in this country, which has always been a Protestant country, let's face it, the majority of those who profess a faith are Protestants. And so this country where Catholicism has not permeated into the culture, still we have lived in a country in which basic laws of morality have been respected and upheld by the civil laws and by the practice of society. And now we are getting to the point where vice, where evil is countenanced openly, publicly, is accepted. And so we need to be all the more strong in our faith. And let us also remember this, that God in his goodness always gives the graces needed to every human being that he creates in whatever stage of the history of the world that person lives. And so we must never use the excuse, well, the world is too strong, the temptations are too great. No, if we do what lies in our part, on our part, God will do his part by his grace to help us persevere and to sanctify ourselves to get to heaven and indeed to become saints. So that's the first point living our Catholic faith in our homes, in our families, living it all the time. And part of living the faith means that we should be 
able to be distinguished for our charity towards one another. I always think of those wonderful words in the Acts of the Apostles of the early Christians, how the pagans would say, see how they love one another. And is it not an astonishing fact that despite constant persecution in the first several hundred years of the existence of the church, it continued to grow. People who knew that they very possibly would be put to death or would be persecuted for their faith, nevertheless became Christians. And what drew them? Of course, it was the doctrines, the teachings of the faith, but it was also the example of the members of the mystical body of Christ that drew them. I want to be one of them. I want to become like them. I want to be part of what makes them what they are. So we should be known for our example, especially in the area of charity. Keep this in mind in particular when it comes to new people. There's a a sad incident that took place a few years ago, not here, but elsewhere in the country, where there was a young couple that came to Mass in that church, and they were new. Now, the man was raised a Catholic, and the woman, the young woman he married, was either nothing or maybe a Protestant, but really didn't know much at all. They were very interested, and they came to Mass, and they had not been married properly in the church. So they needed to go through instruction, etc. And of course, the man who'd been raised a Catholic was very eager to do that and to get his marriage rectified. The young woman was also willing, although she was new to everything. But a well-meaning member of the parish woman went up to this new young woman and admonished her for not being dressed completely modestly and they never came again. And so that's something where she should have come to me, let the priest handle it. It wasn't, we're not talking about gross immodesty, but sometimes people can be imprudent, and we should especially be welcoming to new members to not make them feel that that they are not deserving or or not up to par, etc. We have to realize people have to go through, usually, some stages of understanding and improving their lives. And we have to remember that because many of us have been here for many years. We have had the faith for many years, and we have to be understanding of new persons. Draw them especially by your good example, by your kindness, be outgoing to them. But when it comes to a need to admonish, leave that to the priest, normally speaking. But charity is something we should be uh, recognized for. Also, I want to speak a little bit about culture. Culture is a very important aspect of our lives. There are companies, businesses that have a culture. There are um, communities, groups, etc., clubs, Everything has a culture. And what is the culture? It's kind of like the sum total of the way things are done, the way people treat one another, what their values, how they think, etc., etc. It's a hard thing to define, but it's a very interesting thing to study because sometimes there have been companies, for example, who, which are uh, you know, practically on the verge of bankruptcy. There are all kinds of problems. Workers, employees will come and then they leave, etc. And it's not that maybe they have the wrong principles, but they have a bad culture that needs to be changed. And I, I remember reading about some of these. But we live in a society that has a bad culture. And again, that would be the sum total of the values, the uh, recreations, the type of entertainment, the type of living, the way people think and speak and act towards one another, their language, on and on. So we have to be careful to imbibe and to practice in our homes a Catholic culture and not to get sucked in 
by the culture around us. And I'll give you a couple of practical examples. The fact that so many people go shopping on Sunday. And it can happen that even a faithful traditional Catholic living in this modern society, driving by a store and seeing the parking lot full, having neighbors that just came back and are unloading all their groceries, etc., etc., we can become numb to God's commandment and maybe think, well, nothing so bad about doing a little shopping on Sunday. That's what I mean when I say how a culture that surrounds us can infect us. And we have to put up a safeguard. Remind ourselves, I am going to keep Sunday holy. Sometimes people will say, well, I get bored on Sunday. What, what to do with all my time? You know, it's interesting in the autobiography of the little flower, she talks about what Sunday was like in her family. They would go to an earlier mass, a low mass, and receive communion. And then they would stay for the next mass, the high mass. And then they'd get home, probably closer to noon, prepare a family meal, a dinner, have some time together, take a walk, etc. And then they would go back to church in the evening for vespers and, and public prayers, maybe the rosary, etc. And that's how Sunday was kept in a Catholic society. I've tried it several times. We're going to try it again tomorrow to have vespers and people don't come. I, I tried this here years ago. We did Compline because it's easier to chant Compline on Sundays followed by benediction. And when we first started that, there were a good number of people but as we continued, it got less and less and less. And finally, there was just the seminarians and me, and that's about it, and the sisters. So part of Catholic culture is how we observe the Lord's Day. Now, I realize, and I'm not blaming anyone, some people live a distance from the church. And it's, it's a big thing for them just to get to Mass on Sunday, and by the time they get home, much of the day is, is gone. But if you look in Catholic societies, I remember being in Europe on a Sunday afternoon and seeing all these people out walking, taking their Sunday afternoon stroll. It's one thing they did every week. And they would spend time visiting one another, but shopping was unheard of on Sunday because that's the Lord's Day. That desecrates the Lord's Day. And it should be a day of rest, but primarily a day for the worship of Almighty God. So keep that in mind, how we spend Sunday, the Lord's Day. I believe there should be something extra in addition to just going to Mass on Sunday and fulfilling that bare obligation. Maybe that's why when some people say, I get bored Sunday afternoon, what to do? Because I can't work. What do I do with my time? Beautiful litanies, like the litany of the holy name of Jesus, the litany of the sacred heart, some extra spiritual reading. Especially families. Parents could read about a saint to their children and have a discussion where their children learn to love and appreciate the wonderful models we have in the saints. And again, Catholics visiting one another, visiting other families. So really, if we spend the day as we should, there's plenty to do without individuals having to resort to maybe doing some unnecessary servile work on a Sunday. Of course, hobbies, things of that nature. But let's keep that in mind when we speak about Catholic culture, how we observe Sunday. Another area I'd like to address briefly is the area of dress, how we dress in the house of God. Now, each of us here that is old enough has his own story of what you observed in your local parish, what really woke you up, finally, to Vatican II. But I remember one thing very clearly, uh, and it was in 1967, and I was on a vocations retreat. We had in, our, in the school that year, a priest of the Society of the Divine Word came to our parish school, 
and to the other schools in the diocese and tried to encourage the boys who were thinking about the priesthood to come to a vocations week that summer. So I went and it was kind of half like a retreat, imagine boys at that age, half like a retreat and half having fun and sports, recreation, etc. But I remember one sermon by one of the priests at that retreat that shocked me. And I just had that sense, this is wrong. And what the priest said, because it was a retreat house, which is like a religious house where you have the dormitories, etc., and the dining room, but within the same building, without being even going outside, you can walk to the chapel. So we'd go to the chapel, we'd have daily mass and our prayers, etc. But I remember one sermon in which a priest said, our Lord loves you and he wants you to come and visit him in the chapel. Don't be so worried, don't be so concerned about what you're wearing. If you are bound, been outside and you have your play clothes on, your recreation clothes, and you want to go visit our Lord, go right in. Go ahead. He doesn't, he looks in your heart. He doesn't care what you're wearing. And I just remember to this day that how I was shocked, how I was affected by that. Scandalized, indeed. We would never think of going into a church without being properly attired. And on Saturdays, my parents would not every Saturday, maybe, get us together and go to the church for confessions. Confessions in our parish were three to five every Saturday afternoon. You had two priests hearing to confession, a lot of people lined up, etc. But it's not mass. It's just going to the church for confession, and we would never think of going without first going to our rooms and changing our clothes to have good clothes on. I have to admit this is a battle I gave up on a few years ago. I preached about this several times, and I would still see men and boys come to Mass on Saturdays in the jeans, tennis shoes, t-shirt type of attire. And that's not the way a Catholic would do it in ages past. Now it's true, St. John Vianney, you do read in that story in the book on St. John Vianney how there was a layman who worked out in the fields, and when he came home he would always stop and lean his tools up against the side of the church and go into the church and make a visit. But I just mentioned that when I was growing up, even after Vatican II, it still was part of the culture that you wouldn't think of going into the house of God without changing into what we would call good clothes. Maybe not what you'd wear on Sunday, maybe not a suit and tie, but a dress shirt, dress trousers, black shoes or dress shoes, etc. We would always do that because we were going into God's house. And I just think that was one of the things that started the whole unraveling is when priests would promote, like the one at that retreat, that said, it doesn't matter what you wear. And so let's be careful that we don't slip into that. You go by a Novus Ordo church on a Sunday after Mass when people are coming out, especially in the summer, it's shocking scandalous. So let us uphold that dignity of the house of God and dressing always properly to go to Mass. Uh, another area that that brings up is, speaking of Catholic culture, I mentioned about how we would go to confessions Saturday afternoon. I started this about maybe 15 years ago, and confessions were available for an hour Saturday afternoon, four to five in the afternoon, and I kept it going for about three years. That time I was the only priest here, and that meant not being able to do something else on Saturday, and usually there was one or two people every Saturday, so finally I discontinued it. And then more recently, about a year ago, this was brought up to me, not everybody can get to confession that wants to go to confession on a Sunday. And so I said, all right, we're gonna start again the Saturday confessions, and we'll see how it goes. Because again, I tried it 15 years ago and it didn't last. It just was it didn't take off. And it reminds me of what good, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, an older priest, still living, made a comment once, we were at a retreat for our priest at the Mount actually, 
And he said, Catholics today like one-stop shopping. What he called it. One-stop shopping. They want to go to church, get their mass, their confession, and they're done for the week. You know, when I was growing up, and I showed, I'm sure the older parishioners here, we never heard of somebody going to confession on Sunday. Growing up in a parish of a couple thousand people with two priests, they never heard confessions on Sunday. There were five masses every Sunday morning, one after another. The church, there would be several hundred people at each mass. The priest did not have time to hear confessions. And the reason we've gotten into this practice of the priest having confessions before Mass every Sunday is because of the nature of the traditional movement. Where we grew up, we started with priests traveling around and you had Mass whenever you can get Mass. And the priest maybe came and then he had to move on to another location. And so he would provide always confessions before Mass. But as I said, you know, pre-Vatican two days, I doubt there were many parishes where the priest would even be available for confessions on Sunday. So I just mentioned this by, by way I realize some of our parishioners live at a distance that for them to come here just on Sunday is quite a big chunk of their day, traveling down from up north, and they would like to get to confession and then etc. And so it's fine. We'll continue the confessions on Sunday. But I hope that the practice of confession on Saturday will take off this time, second time around, that people will appreciate that opportunity. Because another thing, keep in mind on Saturday, you can take more time, more of the priest's time. On Sunday, you realize, oh, there's a lineup of people behind me. I don't want to take his time. Also, it's quiet. There's no public prayers going on, etc. Other activity, so you can pray more, prepare well for confession. But that's something that was, you know, regular in the churches before, Saturday afternoon confessions. So these are some things that, to me, come under the heading of a Catholic culture. How we observe Sunday, how we dress for the house of God, and not being just Sunday Catholics, where it's just Mass and I'm done. We're going to start, as I said, at least for the rest of Lent, uh, Vespers, the next three Sundays, and I hope those who live close, who are able, will think about joining for this beautiful part of the liturgy that most lay, lay people aren't even aware of. But you know, it used to be the case, Catholic communities would grow up around monasteries, and the monks would be in there chanting, and the people would like to be present for part of the office, the divine office, the chants that were done. Another aspect I would like to address about a parish is what I would refer to as um, forbearance, patience, forbearance with one another. You know, St. Paul says in one of his epistles to the early Christians, bear one another's burdens and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. We all have to bear something from our neighbor. And it's important that we don't expect perfection from others because we're not perfect ourselves. A good Christian keeps his eyes turned back upon himself, always trying to improve and correct his own behavior and so forth. And I'll mention why I bring this up, what to apply it to, but it can apply to a number of things. And it reminds me of the example or the story of uh, St. Teresa, the little flower, in her autobiography, where she talks about the fact that when she entered the convent, there was an elderly nun who every time she would sit down in the pew, you know, they're praying, and if you've observed religious praying their office in commons, there's standing and sitting, etc. So every time she would sit down, she would rattle her rosary against the side of, side of the pew. Not intentionally, but perhaps carelessly. And for the young St. Therese, it was very annoying. It was grating on her. And she used to get interiorly quite agitated at this. And then, by the grace of God, she realized, this is a cross that God has sent to me to bear. This is an opportunity 
for me to grow in virtue, to practice patience, to grow in merit. And so she got to the point where it didn't even bother her. She offered it up. She maintained her peace of heart and soul. And so ask yourself if there is something in the behavior, in the actions, etc., of another parishioner that bothers you, and maybe you're letting it get to you, instead of just bearing it with patience and saying, this is my cross to carry. And I'm probably annoying to other people by maybe the way I pray or whatever it may be. Now, I don't mean by this to say that there are certain things that should never be corrected. When we pray, we should pray as one voice. Someone who likes to pray a little faster needs to learn to slow down. Someone who would like to pray a little slower needs to speed up and to keep the common pace for common prayer. So there are things of that nature that, yes, sometimes there should be a correction made. Another aspect that this applies to is noise on the part of babies, on the part of children. When I was a young priest, it used to bother me more. It doesn't anymore. Sometimes people, once in a while, you have a baby screaming, but sometimes people will say, well, didn't that bother you today? There's a baby, you know, carrying on, etc." and the parents didn't take the baby out of the church. I said, oh, I, d I didn't notice. I'm concentrating on the Mass. I didn't notice. Now, again, I'm not saying that when parents fail to follow the policy mentioned in the bulletin, they have a baby that's crying and they don't take the baby out of the church, or use the cry room, I'm not saying that that should not be corrected. And I do that from time to time. Maybe not as often as some people would like, but I do it from time to time because they should be considerate of their fellow parishioners. But keep this in mind with young parents. They live with the baby all the time and they probably become adjusted to the noise or the crying. So as we say, cut them a little slack. And I think sometimes elderly parishioners, they would like it to be perfectly quiet and peaceful so they can say their prayers and it just bothers them. Think of St. Teresa and the nun, the nun rattling her beads on the pew. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be a perfect atmosphere. And I will tell you one thing, and that is I would much rather have all the babies we have in the parish making noise than not to have families. We have a parish in the Boston area where there are practically no children at all in the parish. It's all middle-aged and older people. And we're praying for families because if you don't have children, you don't have a future to your church, to your parish. And that's a real concern in some of our parishes around the country. We need the young families and the babies are a blessing. We should thank God that we have children even if they sometimes annoy us. So yes, as I mentioned, the parents need to be considerate. I've mentioned it's in the bulletin as a policy that parents with small children who might make noise should be towards the back so that they can take them out. But there's a balance. There's a balance on the one hand, younger parents who have little children being considerate of parishioners, and on the other hand, older parishioners who've already raised your children and are not around the noise of little children all the time, so you, you know, you're used to a nice, quiet atmosphere in your home and you'd like that in the church, to be a little more patient, a little more forbearing. Think of those words of St. Paul, bear one another's burdens. One of the sisters showed me this just yesterday, wanted to see well, how many children do we have in the parish? And we have 60 children below the age of 12, or 12 and below. So there's your future. But if you have no children, you have no future. And God forbid if we had a parish where older people were so annoyed at the noises little children make, and they made the young couple, parents, feel uncomfortable that they would stop coming or they'd go elsewhere, God forbid that would happen. So as I said, it's a balance. And of course, there's probably always people that are disappointed, displeased with a pastor for not emphasizing too much one side or the other of that balance. There's always 
you know, a human judgment involved. And obviously that's my responsibility. But let us all be grateful for the wonderful young families that we have and the many children that we have. And while I will remind the young parents from time to time to be considerate, take the children out if they're making noise, at the same time, let's be a little more patient, a little more understanding, especially you have a young couple with so many children to take care of and appreciative of the fact that we have uh, so many children. Speaking of parents, another comment I would like to make is on the importance of supervision. It's interesting because this went briefly into the reading that we had for lunch downstairs, the spiritual reading. And it was about a, a woman, a mother, who didn't use proper supervision of her children, or a daughter, I think, in the case that was cited. The importance of parents not forgetting the strength of passion and the disorder of our fallen human nature. And as we get older, we can tend to forget how strong were the temptations we experienced in our youth. Because for children, for teenagers, for young adults, their passions are much more strong, much more demanding than they will be as they get older. And it can happen that parents tend to be naive. And you can have parents who are very pious. They pray the rosary every day with their family, but they are oblivious to what their children are doing. And I especially mention this in regards to the internet. To have the internet in your home and allow children access to it without proper supervision, control, etc., you are responsible for any sins that they may commit and especially bad habits. Not just individual sins, but bad habits that can be very difficult to break. So parents need to be not just pious and leading their children in prayer, they also have to be vigilant and always remember that your children, no matter how obedient they may be to you and respectful and helpful and do what they're told and do their homework and say their prayers, they still have a fallen human nature. And we must remember that. Remember the words of our Lord. Woe to the person who is guilty of scandal. There will be scandals. Our Lord put it, there must needs be that scandals come. Nevertheless, woe to the man through whom scandal comes. And there's a tremendous amount of scandal today, everywhere, every day, all over the world, through especially the entertainment media, whether it's movies, radio, uh, recorded music, um, again, the internet, uh, books, etc., etc. And we have to be careful. It's not really fair to your children to put them in that situation where they're bombarded with these things and not providing them the proper safeguards and guidance, etc. Now, of course, and I realize it's quite a challenge today for parents, but you can't just take away what's bad. You have to provide something to take its place. You have to give them what is good. You have to provide wholesome entertainment, good friends that your children can associate, good wholesome activities and hobbies and so forth, entertainment that is unobjectionable for their, for their enjoyment. So that's something to keep in mind, good music, etc. You know, we were talking about um, the internet and the dangers there. The internet can be a wonderful tool for good. We have parishioners in some of our parishes back east who found out about us on the internet and then started coming to Mass and learned about traditional Catholicism, etc. So it can be used for good. We just have this difficulty today of threading the needle, you might say, avoiding the pitfalls on one side or the other, and using 
the technology that God has given for our sanctification for the good of our children. So remember that, the importance of supervision, the importance of care. As our Lord said about scandal, that it would be better for a man who is guilty of scandal to have a millstone hanged about his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea because he went on to say the their angels, speaking of children, their angels always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. So let us keep them away from the scandals of the world and yes, provide something good in its place. So these are a few reflections I wanted to make that are of more a pastoral nature, that how we live as Catholics, how we take our Catholic faith and let it permeate our way of living. And you know something else? Catholicism is a beautiful thing. It is a joyful way of life. People on the outside often will look at us and will say, well, I know you're right, but I couldn't live that way. Too hard. Too much to give up. Too much I'd have to do, etc. Because they recognize the beauty of the Catholic way of life. Let us show them not just the beauty, but the joy. The joy of serving God, of living according to his commandments, of obeying him. One thing that really struck me, and I hold this up to the seminarians all the time, about the life of St. Dominic Savio. As I mentioned, yesterday was his feast day. And St. Dominic Savio became known of course, for virtue, you've all heard stories like the one where he went between two boys who were so angry they were going to throw rocks at one another. He went and stood in the midst and held up a crucifix. And he reconciled them to one another. He was a peacemaker. And not only that, but St. Dominic Savio wasn't like a wilting flower off in the corner, kneeling in the corner of the playground saying his prayers when the boys were recreating. In fact, St. John Bosco said they wanted him to be on their team when they would choose up teams because he was fun to be around, but yet they would watch their language when he was around. And one of the things that's pointed out in his life is that he tried to do everything he was supposed to do cheerfully. St. John Bosco gave a sermon one evening, and St. Dominic was trying so hard to be good he was trying so hard, he would sometimes get headaches because of his intensity. And he was also doing penances, some penances that were beyond the, the health of his frail body. And St. John Bosco wisely told him what he could do and what he couldn't do by the way of penance. And he said, just do everything you're supposed to do every day and do it with cheerfulness. And that was a revelation to the young Dominic Savio. He realized he could sanctify himself by attending class with attention, doing his homework, doing his chores, engaging in recreation with the other boys, going into chapel, following the routine of the life in the oratory, and doing everything he did with cheerfulness. That is something we should emulate. Strive to serve God with a cheerful heart because it is a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing to have the true faith and to practice it, to live it. It should not cause us sadness. It should cause us joy of heart. Let us serve God joyfully and may our example and our prayers draw others to enter the church to the beautiful practice of the Catholic faith, to lead others along with ourselves to God by the way that we live, by the way we treat others, and by our good example. Let us kneel now in reflection. <clears throat>